Warning, the following stories you are about to hear are truly disturbing. Make sure to subscribe or I will come for you. I went on a camping trip with my sister. She went missing and one day she randomly returned. Her eyes were black and she was never the same. I don't even know where to start. This story has been eating me alive, and I think it's time I finally share it. Maybe putting it out there will help me make sense of it, or maybe it'll just confirm that I'm not losing my mind. Here goes nothing. Last summer, my sister Emily and I decided to go on a camping trip. We grew up in a small town in Oregon, surrounded by forests, so nature has always been a big part of our lives. Emily was always the adventurous one. She convinced me that a weekend away in the woods would be the perfect way to unwind from the stress of everyday life. We picked a spot about two hours from home, deep in the heart of the forest. It wasn't an official campsite, but we had heard from a few friends that it was a great spot for some peace and quiet. We packed our gear loaded up the car, and set off on a sunny Friday morning. The drive was uneventful. We laughed, sang along to the radio, and reminisced about our childhood. Emily was in high spirits, talking about how she couldn't wait to disconnect from the world and just enjoy the serenity of the woods. We arrived at the spot around noon, and it was everything we had hoped for. Tall trees, a crystal clear stream, and not another soul in sight. We set up our tent, gathered some firewood, and started to relax. The first night was perfect. We roasted marshmallows, told ghost stories, and just enjoyed each other's company. It felt like we were kids again, without a care in the world. But everything changed the next day. We woke up early, had a quick breakfast, and decided to go for a hike. Emily had brought a map of the area, and she wanted to explore a nearby trail. We packed some snacks and water and set off into the forest. The trail was beautiful, but it was easy to get lost if you weren't paying attention. We walked for a few hours, enjoying the sights and sounds of nature, until we came to a fork in the path. Emily wanted to take the left path, which supposedly led to a hidden waterfall. I was hesitant, but she convinced me to go along with it. The path was narrower and more overgrown, and it felt like we were the first people to walk it in years. After about an hour, we reached a small clearing. There was no waterfall in sight, just an old, dilapidated cabin. Uh, the cabin looked like it had been abandoned for decades. The windows were broken, the door was hanging off its hinges, and the roof had partially caved in. Emily, being the curious one, wanted to check it out. I had told her it was a bad idea, but she just laughed and said we hadn't come this far. We might as well take a look. Reluctantly, I followed her inside. The inside was even worse than the outside. It was dark, damp, and filled with a musty smell. There were old, rotting pieces of furniture scattered around, and the floor was covered in dirt and de debris. Emily started poking around, looking for anything interesting. I was about to tell her we should leave when I noticed something strange in the corner of the room. It was a trap door partially hidden under a pile of old blankets. I called Emily over, and we both stared at it, debating whether or not to open it. In hindsight, I wish we had just left it alone, but curiosity got the better of us, and Emily pulled the door open. The smell that came out of that trap door was like nothing I had ever experienced. It was a mix of decay, mold, and something else I couldn't quite place. We both gagged, but Emily was determined to see what was down there. 
She grabbed her flashlight and started to descend the rickety ladder. I stood at the top, watching her disappear into the darkness. After a few moments, she called up to me, saying there was some kind of room down there. I reluctantly followed her, holding my breath to avoid the stench. When I reached the bottom, I saw what she was talking about. It was a small underground room, maybe ten feet by ten feet. The walls were lined with shelves, filled with jars and bottles of all shapes and sizes. Most of them were covered in dust and cobwebs, but a few looked relatively new. Emily was examining one of the newer jars when she suddenly gasped and dropped it. The jar shattered on the ground, and a thick, dark liquid oozed out. The smell intensified, and I felt my stomach churn. Emily looked pale, and she muttered something about getting out of there. We scrambled back up the ladder and out of the cabin, not stopping until we were back on the main trail. We didn't talk much on the way back to camp. Both of us were shaken by what we had seen, and the smell seemed to cling to us no matter how much we tried to shake it off. By the time we got back to our tent, it was starting to get dark. We decided to call it night and try to forget about the whole thing. I woke up in the middle of the night to find Emily missing. Her sleeping bag was empty and her shoes were gone. Panic set in as I called out for her, but there was no response. I grabbed a flashlight and started searching the surrounding area, but she was nowhere to be found. I spent the rest of the night awake, sitting by the campfire, hoping she would come back. But as the hours passed, I started to fear the worst. When the sun came up, I decided to hike back to the car and get help. But just as I was about to leave, I heard a rustling in the bushes. Emily stumbled into the clearing looking disoriented and filthy. Her clothes were torn and there were scratches all over her arms and legs. But the thing that scared me the most was her eyes. They were pitch black with no whites or pupils, just an endless dark void. She didn't say a word. I just walked past me and into the tent. I followed her, trying to ask what had happened, but she ignored me. She lay down in her sleeping bag and closed her eyes as if nothing had happened. I stood there, in shock, not knowing what to do. The rest of the weekend was a blur. Emily didn't speak or make eye contact with me. She just stared off into space, her eyes still that unnatural black. I tried to get her to talk to tell me what had happened, but it was like she wasn't even there. On Sunday we packed up and headed home. I kept glancing over at her, hoping she would snap out of it, but she remained silent. When we got home, our parents were obviously worried. I tried to explain in what had happened, but it sounded ridiculous even to me. They took Emily to the hospital, but the doctors couldn't find anything physically wrong with her. They said she was, was in shock and that it might take some time for her to recover. But Emily never did recover. She was never the same after that trip. She barely spoke, and when she did, it was in a flat, emotionless voice. Her once vibrant personality was gone, replaced by a hollow shell of the person she used to be. And her eyes, they never went back to normal. They remained that haunting black, a constant reminder of the nightmare we had experienced. I don't know what happened to my sister in those woods, and I'm not sure I want to find out. But one thing is certain. Something evil lives out there, and it took my sister from me. If you ever find yourself near that cabin, turn around and leave. Some doors are better left unopened. After that trip, my life was a mess. 
My parents were beside themselves with worry about Emily. They put her in therapy, hoping it would help her recover, but nothing seemed to make a difference. She would just sit there, staring off into space with those black, soulless eyes. The vibrant, adventurous girl I knew was gone, replaced by someone or something I didn't recognize. I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister had happened in those woods. I couldn't just let it go. I needed answers. So I started doing some research. I spent hours online reading about missing persons cases, local legends, and anything that might give me a clue about what we had stumbled upon. One night I came across an old forum post about the area where we had camped. A user mentioned strange occurrences and missing hikers around the same spot. There were rumors about an old cabin deep in the woods, a place locals referred to as the Devil's Shack. According to the post, people who went there often disappeared or came back changed. That was enough to convince me that I needed to go back. I had to know what had happened to Emily. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't at least try to find some answers. I packed a bag with supplies and a flashlight, and the next morning I set off for the forest alone. The drive there felt surreal, like I was retracing my steps into a nightmare. I parked the car in the same spot, took a deep breath, and started the hike to the cabin. The forest was eerily quiet, and every rustle of leaves made me jump. It took me a few hours, but I finally found the cabin again. It looked even more decrepit than before, if that was possible. My heart was pounding as I approached the front door. I hesitated, remembering the trap door and the awful smell from before, but I pushed the thought aside and stepped inside. The same musty smell hit me, and I fought the urge to turn and run. Instead, I forced myself to walk towards the corner where we had found the trap door. It was still there, partially covered by the same old blankets. I took a deep breath and opened it. The stench was overpowering, and I gagged as I climbed down the ladder. The room looked exactly the same as I remembered, with shelves lined with jars and bottles. Most of them were covered in dust, but a few looked disturbingly new. I started examining the jars, trying to make sense of their contents. Some were filled with dark, viscous liquids, while others contained what looked like herbs and other plant matter. Then I saw something that made my blood run cold. One of the jars had a label on it, written in a language I didn't recognize. Inside the jar was what looked like a small, shriveled human heart. I stumbled back, my mind racing. What the hell was this place? Why were there human organs in jars? I needed answers, but I didn't know where to start. As I continued to search the room, I found an old leather-bound book on one of the shelves. It was covered in dust and cobwebs, but it looked like it had been used recently. I opened the book, and my hands were shaking as I flipped through the pages. It was filled with handwritten notes, diagrams, and symbols I couldn't understand. But one thing was clear. Whoever wrote this was into some seriously dark stuff. There were references to their rituals, sacrifices, and something called the Dark One. The more I read, the more I felt like I was losing my mind. Then I heard a noise from above. Footsteps. Someone was in the cabin. My heart raced as I quickly hid the book in my bag and climbed back up the ladder. As I emerged from the trap door, I saw a figure standing in the doorway. It was a man, tall and thin, with a gaunt face and hollow eyes. He was staring at me with an intensity that made my skin crawl. 
What are you doing here? He demanded, his voice cold and menacing. And I stammered, trying to come up with an excuse. I I got lost, I lied. I was just looking for a place to rest. He didn't seem to believe me. You shouldn't be here, he said, stepping closer. This place is dangerous. I nodded, trying to hide my fear. I'll leave right away, I said, backing towards the door. Not so fast, he said, grabbing my arm. His grip was like iron. You've seen too much. Panic set in as I struggled to break free. Let go of me, I shouted, but he only tightened his grip. You need to understand, he said, his eyes boring into mine. This place holds secrets that are not meant for the living. If you value your life, you'll forget you ever came here. With a surge of adrenaline, I wrenched my arm free and bolted out the door. I didn't stop running until I was back at my car, gasping for breath. I threw my bag in the back seat and sped away, my mind racing with what I had seen. When I got home, I locked all the doors and windows, paranoia setting in. I took out the book and started reading it again, hoping to find some answers. The more I read, the more I realized that Emily wasn't the first person to come back changed from that place. The book spoke of a dark presence that could take hold of a person's soul, leaving them hollow and empty. Over the next few days, I tried to piece together what had happened. I became obsessed with the book, spending every waking moment trying to decipher its contents. My nights were plagued by nightmares of the man in the cabin and the dark rituals described in the book. Emily's condition didn't improve. She barely ate, barely slept. And when she did speak, it was in that same flat, emotionless voice. My parents were at their wit's end, and I didn't know how to help them. I couldn't tell them what I had found. They would think I was crazy. One night, as I was reading the book, I came across a passage that chilled me to the bone. It described a ritual that could potentially reverse the effects of the dode, the dark one's influence. But it required a sacrifice, a life for a life. I didn't want to believe it, but part of me knew that it was the only way to save Emily. I had to make a choice. Let her remain a hollow shell or take a life to restore hers. The thought of taking someone's life was unbearable, but so was the thought of losing my sister forever. I knew what I had to do. But the decision weighed heavily on my soul. As I prepared for what lay ahead, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I started seeing shadows out of the corner of my eye, and the nightmares became more intense. The man from the cabin haunted my dreams, his hollow eyes burning into my soul. I was on the edge of sanity, torn between having my sister and losing myself in the process. The forest, the cabin, the book, they were all connected, part of a dark web that had ensnared my sister and now threatened to consume me. I could only hope that I had the strength to face what lay ahead and that I wouldn't lose myself to the darkness that lurked in the shadows. I can't believe I'm doing this. Writing everything down makes it feel more real, and honestly, I'm terrified of what's to come. But I need to keep going, if not for myself, then for Emily. After days of sleepless nights and constant anxiety, I finally made the decision. I would do whatever it took to save my sister. The ritual in the book was my only hope, even if it meant sacrificing another life. I hated myself for even considering it. But every time I looked at Emily, sitting there lifeless and empty, I knew I couldn't live with myself if I didn't try. The book was clear about what I needed. A life, willingly given, under the light of the full moon. That night was approaching fast, and I had no idea 
how I was going to find someone willing to sacrifice themselves. The thought made me sick, but I pushed through it, knowing that this was the only way. The days leading up to the full moon were a blur. I barely ate, barely slept. I was consumed by the darkness of the book and the overwhelming guilt of what I was about to do. Every time I closed my eyes, I sought a man from the cabin, his hollow eyes staring into my soul, judging me. I decided to return to the forest, hoping that being there that would give me some clarity or guidance. I didn't tell anyone where I was going. I just packed my bag, grabbed the book, and left. The drive felt like a death march, each mile bringing me closer to the nightmare I was about to face. I arrived at the edge of the forest just as the sun was setting. The shadows lengthened, casting an eerie glow over the trees. I took a deep breath and started to hike to the cabin. This time, I was more prepared. I had brought a knife, a flashlight, and a small vial of holy water. I didn't know if any of it would help, but it made me feel a little less helpless. When I reached the cabin, the full moon was just beginning to rise. Its pale light cast long shadows across the clearing, making the cabin look even more menacing than before. I steeled myself and stepped inside. The smell hit me again, that awful mix of decay and mold. I made my way to the trap door, my hand shaking as I opened it. The room below was just as I had left it, filled with jars and the lingering stench of death. I took out the book and began to prepare for the ritual. The instructions were detailed and gruesome. I had to draw a circle in the dirt, place candles at the cardinal points, and use the blood of the willing sacrifice to inscribe runes around the perimeter. As I read through the steps, my mind raced. Where was I going to find someone willing to die for this? And even if I did, how could I live with myself after? I was lost in thought when I heard a noise from above. Footsteps. My heart skipped a beat as I looked up, expecting to see the man from before. But it wasn't him. It was Emily. She stood at the top of the ladder, her black eyes staring down at me. She looked different, more alive, more aware. For a moment, I felt a flicker of hope. Maybe she had come back to herself. Maybe she was here to help. But then she spoke, and that hope died. You shouldn't be here, she said, her voice cold and devoid of emotion. Emily, I stammered, I'm trying to save you. She shook her head. You can't save me. You don't understand what you're dealing with. I climbed up the ladder, desperate to reach her. Then, help me understand. Tell me what happened. She stepped back, her expression unreadable. It's too late. You've already seen too much. He's coming for you now. My blood ran cold. Who? The man from the cabin. She nodded. He's not just a man. He's the Dark One, and you brought him here. Before I could respond, I felt a sudden, intense pain in my chest. I looked down and saw a dark stain spreading across my shirt. Blood. My blood. I stumbled back, trying to process what was happening. Emily stood there, watching me with those black eyes, her face a mask of indifference. You need to leave, she said again, her voice echoing in my ears. I didn't have a choice. I grabbed the book and ran out of the cabin, my vision blurring as the pain intensified. I barely made it to the clearing before I collapsed, my strength leaving me. The last thing I saw before I lost consciousness was the full moon, its light casting a pale glow over the trees. I woke up hours later, the pain still throbbing in my chest. I was lying on the ground outside the cabin, the book clutched in my hand. I struggled to my feet, my mind reeling from what had happened. Emily had warned me, but I didn't understand why. Why had she hurt me? Why had she told me to leave? 
I stumbled back to my car, my body weak and my mind racing. As I drove home, I replayed her words over and over in my head. The dark one. He was coming for me. But why? What did he want? When I got home, I locked myself in my room and opened the book again. There had to be something in there that could help me understand. I read through the pages, searching for any mention of the Dark One. And then I found it. He was a demon. An ancient entity that thrived on fear and despair. The cabin was his lair, a place where he could trap and torment those who ventured too close. Emily had been taken by him, her soul consumed, and her body used as a vessel. The ritual wasn't to save her, it was to summon him, and I had almost played right into his hands. I felt a wave of nausea as the realization hit me. I had been so focused on saving Emily that I hadn't seen the bigger picture, the book, the cabin, the man. They were all part of a trap designed to lure in the desperate and the foolish. I knew then that I had to destroy a book. It was the only way to break the cycle and keep the Dark One from claiming more victims. I took it outside, doused it in gasoline, and set it on fire. As the flames consumed the pages, I felt a strange sense of relief. It was over, or so I thought. The nightmares didn't stop. If anything, they got worse. The man from the cabin haunted my dreams, his hollow eyes staring into my soul. I saw Emily, trapped and tormented, her black eyes pleading for help. And I felt the presence of the Dark One, his shadowy form lurking just beyond the edge of my vision. I knew then that destroying the book hadn't been enough. The Dark One was still out there, and he wasn't done with me. The only way to stop him was to confront him, to face the darkness head on. I didn't know if I had the strength to do it, but I didn't have a choice. Emily's life, and my own, depended on it. It's taken me a while to get to this point, partly because reliving these memories is like tearing open an old wound, and partly because I'm scared that I've put this out there. But I need to finish this. I owe it to Emily and to myself. After I burned the book, I thought I was safe. But the nightmares continued, more vivid and terrifying than before. The man from the cabin with his hollow eyes haunted my every dream. Emily was there too, her black eyes filled with a silent plea for help. The presence of the Dark One was a constant oppressive weight lurking just beyond my consciousness. I couldn't live like this. I knew I had to go back one last time. I had to face the darkness and end this nightmare once and for all. I spent days preparing, gathering supplies, and researching everything I could about the Dark One. Most of what I found was fragmented and cryptic, but one thing was clear, confronting him would be the fight of my life. The night of the full moon, I set out for the forest again. I didn't tell anyone where I was going. This was something I had to do alone. The drive felt like a death march, each mile bringing me closer to the inevitable confrontation. When I reached the edge of the forest, I took a deep breath, steeling myself for what lay ahead. The hike to the cabin was grueling. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, made my heart race. The forest seemed darker, more menacing than before. By the time I reached the clearing, the full moon was high in the sky, casting an eerie glow over the cabin. I stepped inside, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. The smell of decay was stronger than ever, and I had to fight the urge to gag. I made my way to the trap door, knowing that whatever answers I sought were down there. The room below was unchanged, the jars and bottles still lining the shelves. I took out a piece of chalk and 
began to draw the protective circle on the floor, just as the book had instructed. I placed candles at the cardinal points and lit them, their flickering flames casting long shadows on the walls. As I stood in the center of the circle, I called out to the dark one, my voice trembling. Show yourself, I demanded, my heart pounding in my chest. I know you're here. Face me. For a moment, nothing happened. The room was deathly silent. Then, the shadows seemed to grow darker, coalescing into a figure. The man from the cabin stepped forward, his hollow eyes fixed on me. You're a fool, he said, his voice cold and mocking. You think you can challenge me? I forced myself to stand tall, even though every instinct screamed at me to run. I won't let you have her, I said. I won't let you take Emily. He laughed, a chilling sound that echoed off the walls. Your sister is mine. Her soul belongs to me. Anger flared within me, giving me strength. No, I said, my voice steady. I'll free her, no matter what it takes. The man's expression darkened. Very well, he said, but know this, to challenge me is to invite death. With that, he lunged at me, his form shifting and twisting into something monstrous. I raised my hands, chanting the incantation I had memorized from the book. The protective circle flared to life, a barrier of light that held the dark one at bay. He howled in rage, his form writhing against the barrier. You cannot stop me, he roared. I am eternal. I continued to chant, pouring all my fear, anger, and desperation into the words. The room seemed to pulse with energy, the air crackling with attention. The dark one thrashed against the barrier, his form flickering and shifting. Then, from the darkness, I heard Emily's voice. James, she whispered, her voice weak but clear. Help me. I turned to see her standing just outside the circle, her black eyes filled with pain. Emily, I cried, reaching out to her. I'm here. I'll save you. She stepped forward, but the dark one lashed out, dragging her back into the shadows. She is mine, he snarled. You cannot have her. I felt a surge of determination. I will save her, I said, my voice strong. I won't let you win. With a final burst of energy, I completed the incantation. The room erupted in light, the barrier expanding and enveloping the Dark One. He screamed, his form disintegrating on in the light. Emily collapsed to the floor, her eyes closed. I rushed to her side, my heart in my throat. Emily, I said, shaking her gently, wake up. For a moment, she didn't move. Then she opened her eyes. They were no longer black, but the vibrant blue I remembered. James, she whispered, tears streaming down her face. You did it. You saved me. I pulled her into my arms, relief flooding through me. I promised I would, I said, my voice choked with emotion. We sat there for a long time, holding each other. The darkness had been banished, the nightmare finally over. As we made our way out of the cabin, the first light of dawn was breaking through the trees. We were free. In the weeks that followed, Emily began to recover. She was still shaken by her experience, but she was slowly returning to the sister I knew and loved. The nightmares stopped and the oppressive presence of the Dark One faded from my mind. I knew we had been lucky. We had faced the darkness and come out the other side. But I also knew that we would never be the same. The experience had changed us, leaving scars that would never fully heal. I still think about the cabin sometimes, and the evil that lurked there. I wonder how many others have fallen victim to its darkness, how many lives have been shattered by the Dark One's influence. 
I know that we were just two of the many, and that there are still unanswered questions. But for now, I'm grateful to have my sister back. We've faced the darkness together, and we've come out stronger. Whatever the future holds, I know that we can face it together. Thank you for listening to my story. I hope it serves as a warning to others. Some doors are better left unopened, and some secrets are better left in the dark. Stay safe, and don't let the darkness take you. I went on a family trip in the Canadian woods. We found Jeff the killer. I never imagined I'd be writing something like this, but here I am, hoping that sharing my story might help me make sense of it all. Last summer, my family decided to take a trip to the Canadian woods. It was supposed to be a bonding experience, a way to escape the chaos of our daily lives. My parents, my younger sister Lisa and I, were all looking forward to it. We rented a cabin deep in the forest, far from any signs of civilization. The first couple of days were everything we hoped for, peaceful, serene, and completely disconnected from the outside world. We spent our time hiking, fishing, and roasting marshmallows by the campfire. It felt like we were living in a different era, free from the constant buzz of our technology but that sense of tranquility didn't last. On the third night, something strange happened. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of footsteps outside our cabin. At first, I thought it might be a deer or some other animal, but the steps were too heavy, too deliberate. I got out of bed and peered through the window, but I couldn't see anything in the darkness. Just as I was about to turn away, I saw a flash of white. It was there for a split second, but it was enough to make my heart race. The next morning, I told my family about it, but they brushed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me. I tried to convince myself that they were right, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. That evening, we decided to explore a nearby lake. The trail was narrow and overgrown, and the deeper we went, the more uneasy I felt. It was like the forest itself was closing in on us. We finally reached the lake and set up a small picnic. Lisa was splashing around in the water while my parents were chatting, laughing. I tried to relax, but that nagging feeling wouldn't leave me. Then, out of nowhere, Lisa let out a blood-curdling scream. We all turned to see her standing in the water, pointing towards the trees on the other side of the lake. I followed her gaze and saw it, a pale, white face with a twisted, maniacal grin staring back at us. It was gone in an instant, but I knew what I saw. My parents tried to calm Lisa down, saying it was probably just a trick of the light. But I knew better. That face was burned into my mind. We packed up and headed back to the cabin, but the atmosphere had changed. There was a palpable sense of fear in the air. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every little noise made me jump, and I kept replaying the image of that face in my head. Around midnight, I heard something outside again. This time, it was closer. I crept out of bed and slowly opened the front door. The forest was eerily silent, and the moon cast an eerie glow over everything. I stepped outside, my heart pounding in my chest. I was about to turn back when I heard a faint whisper. It was coming from the edge of the clearing, just beyond the tree line. I moved closer my curiosity outweighing my fear. As I approached, the whisper grew louder, more distinct. It was saying my name. 
David, David. My blood ran cold. I turned to run back to the cabin, but I tripped over something and fell hard to the ground. When I looked up, I saw him standing there. Jeff, the killer. His face was inches from mine. That same twisted grin etched across his pale skin. His eyes were black voids, empty and soulless. I was paralyzed with fear, unable to move or scream. He reached out and stroked my cheek with a gloved hand, his touch cold and unnatural. Go to sleep, he whispered, his breath hot against my face. I don't know how, but I managed to scramble to my feet and run back to the cabin. I slammed the door shut and locked it, my whole body trembling. My parents woke up, alarmed by the noise, but I couldn't find the words to explain what had just happened. The rest of the night was a blur. I stayed up clutching a kitchen knife, my eyes glued to the windows. I kept expecting him to appear, to break down the door and finish what he started, but he never did. Morning came, and the forest seemed almost normal again, but I knew better. We decided to cut our trip short and head back to civilization. On the drive back, we didn't say much. The experience had shaken us all, and we just wanted to put it behind us, but I can't. Every time I close my eyes, I see his face. Every whisper of the wind sounds like his voice. I don't know why he let me go, or if he'll come back. All I know is that the Canadian woods aren't safe. There's something out there, something that shouldn't exist. And it's waiting. We got home a few days earlier than planned. My parents didn't really talk about what happened, and Lisa seemed to be trying hard to forget the whole thing. But I couldn't. My mind kept replaying that night. Those eyes. That face. It haunted my dreams and turned every shadow into a potential threat. Back home, I tried to resume my normal life. School started back up, and I did my best to focus on classes and friends. But the feeling of being watched never went away. It was like Jeff the Killer had followed me back from the woods, working just out of sight. One night, about a week after we got home, I woke up again. This time, I was in my own bed, in my own room. But the feeling was the same. I felt eyes on me. I sat up, heart pounding, and looked around. My room was dark, the only light coming from the street lamp outside my window. And then I saw it, a shadow moving outside. I tried to convince myself it was just a trick of the light, but deep down I knew it wasn't. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, but before I could press call, the shadow moved again and I saw him. Jeff, standing outside my window, grinning up at me. I couldn't breathe. I dropped my phone and scrambled back, pressing myself against the headboard. He just stood there, staring that horrible grin never leaving his face. I don't know how long I sat there frozen, but eventually he turned and walked away, disappearing into the darkness. I told my parents the next morning, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was just having nightmares because of what happened in the woods, but I knew it was real. Jeff was real, and he was after me. A few nights later, I woke up to the sound of scratching at my window. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't help myself. I peeked out and saw him again clawing at the glass with those long, pale fingers. I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. He pressed his face against the window, his eyes boring into mine. Go to sleep, he mouthed, his breath fogging up the glass. I don't remember much of what happened next. I must have passed out because the next thing I knew, it was morning.
and my window was cracked, but there was no sign of Jeff. I felt like I was going crazy. My parents still didn't believe me, and Lisa was starting to look at me like I was a stranger. One night, I decided to set up a camera. I needed proof. I positioned it so it would catch the window and hit record before going to bed. I lay there, pretending to sleep, but I was wide awake, waiting. Hours passed, and nothing happened. I started to think maybe I really was losing it, but then, around 3 a.m., I heard it again, scratching. I forced myself to stay still, to keep my eyes closed, and let the camera do its job. The sound stopped, and I heard the faintest whisper of, go to sleep. I waited until morning, then rushed to check the footage. What I saw made my blood run cold. There he was, Jeff the killer, standing outside my window, his face inches from the glass. He stood there for what felt like hours, just staring before finally turning and walking away. I had proof now, but I didn't know what to do with it. I showed my parents the footage, and finally, they believed me. We went to the police, but they were skeptical. They said it was probably just a prank, some kid messing with me. They agreed to patrol our neighborhood for a few nights, but I could tell they didn't take it seriously. That night, I didn't sleep. I sat in the living room with a baseball bat, waiting. Around midnight, I heard a noise at the back door. I crept over and peeked through the window, and there he was, trying to break in. I shouted, and he looked up, those black eyes locking onto mine. He grinned and ran off into the night. The police came, but by then he was long gone. They said they'd increase their patrols, but it didn't make me feel any safer. I knew Jeff wouldn't stop until he got what he wanted. And what he wanted was me. The next few days were a blur of fear and paranoia. I barely slept, jumping at every little noise. My parents were just as scared, and Lisa wouldn't leave my side. We were prisoners in our own home, waiting for the next time he'd show up. And then one night, he did. I woke up to find him standing at the foot of my bed, his knife glinting in the moonlight. He raised it, and I knew this was it. I was going to die. But just as he brought it down, I heard a gunshot. Jeff stumbled back, blood pouring from a wound in his shoulder. My dad stood in the doorway, holding a smoking gun. Jeff turned and fled, disappearing into the night once more. The police came and searched the area, but they didn't find him. They said he probably wouldn't be back, but I knew better. Jeff the killer doesn't give up. He's still out there, waiting. I don't know if I'll ever be safe again. Every time I close my eyes, I see his face, hear his voice. I don't know why he chose me, but I know he won't stop until he finishes what he started. And that's the most terrifying part of all. Life didn't return to normal after that. My dead shot may have driven Jeff away temporarily, but the damage was done. We were prisoners in our own home, constantly looking over our shoulders. The police increased their patrols, but I knew it was only a matter of time before Jeff came back. Sleep became a luxury I could no longer afford. Every creak of the house, every rustle outside, sent my heart racing. My parents took turns keeping watch, but we were all running on fumes. Lisa started having nightmares, waking up screaming in the middle of the night. She wouldn't tell us what she saw, but I knew it was him. One evening, my mom suggested we go stay with my aunt in a different city. I could see the desperation in her eyes, the need to escape this living nightmare. We packed up and left that night, hoping that putting some distance between us and the house would keep us safe. 
for a few days. Things seemed to get better. My aunt's place was a small, cozy house in a quiet neighborhood. There were no woods, no isolated trails, just suburbia. I started to feel a little safer, like maybe we'd left Jeff behind, but deep down I knew it was just a temporary reprieve. On the fourth night, I woke up again. This time it wasn't to the sound of scratching or footsteps. It was a feeling, an overwhelming sense of dread that washed over me. I sat up and looked around, my heart pounding. Everything seemed normal, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I got out of bed and checked on Lisa. She was sleeping soundly, her breathing even. I moved to my parents' room and found them both awake, sitting on the edge of the bed. They felt it too. We didn't say anything. We just knew. The house was silent as we gathered in the living room, trying to decide what to do next. Then we heard it, a faint knock at the door. It was soft, almost polite, but it sent chills down my spine. My dad motioned for us to stay put as he grabbed his gun and approached the door. Who's there? He called out, his voice steady despite the fear in his eyes. There was no answer, just another knock. A little louder this time. My dad took a deep breath and opened the door. Gun at the ready. The porch light cast a yellow glow, but there was no one there. He stepped outside, scanning the area, but it was empty. Just as he was about to turn back, we heard it, Jeff's voice, coming from the darkness. Go to sleep. My dad fired a shot into the night, but it didn't matter. Jeff wasn't there. He was playing with us, taunting us. We quickly locked the door and huddled together, trying to come up with a plan. We couldn't stay here. We had to leave. But where could we go? Suddenly, the power went out. The house plunged into darkness, and I felt a wave of panic wash over me. We fumbled for flashlights and huddled together, the tiny beams of light doing little to chase away the fear. We needed to get out, but we were trapped. Then the whispers started. At first it was just a faint murmur, but it grew louder, more insistent. It was Jeff, whispering my name over and over again. David, David, go to sleep. The sound seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. We had to move. My dad led the way, gun in hand, as we made our way to the back door. But just as we reached it, the whispers stopped, replaced by a chilling laugh. I turned and saw him, standing in the doorway to the living room, that same twisted grin on his face. Time seemed to slow down. My dad raised the gun, but Jeff was too fast. He lunged forward, knocking my dad to the ground. The gun skidded across the floor, out of reach. My mom screamed, and Lisa was crying, but all I could do was stand there, frozen. Jeff turned his attention to me, his eyes gleaming with madness. Go to sleep, he whispered, his voice barely audible over the sound of my own heartbeat. He took a step forward, and I snapped out of my paralysis. I grabbed a nearby lamp and swung it at him, the impact sending him stumbling back. Run! I shouted to my family, and we bolted for the door. We made it outside, but Jeff was right behind us. We ran through the neighborhood, our footsteps echoing off the silent houses. I could hear him laughing, that insane, mocking laughter as he chased us. We reached a neighbor's house and banged on the door, praying someone would let us in. The door opened, and an elderly couple stood there, looking bewildered. They let us in, and we quickly explained what was happening. They called the police, but by the time they arrived, Jeff was gone. The police searched the area, but found no sign of him. They didn't believe us, of course. To them, 
It was just another case of hysteria, a family scared by their own shadows. But we knew the truth. Jeff the killer was out there, and he wouldn't stop until he got what he wanted. We couldn't stay with my aunt anymore. We packed up again and moved to a hotel, trying to stay one step ahead of him. But the fear never left us. Every night, I lay awake, listening for the sound of his voice, waiting for the moment when he'd come for me. I don't know how much longer we can keep running. To turn Jeff is relentless and he won't stop until he finishes what he started. Every time I close my eyes, I see his face, hear his voice. I don't know why he chose me, but I know he won't stop until one of us is dead. The days blurred together as we moved from place to place, never staying long enough to feel safe. The constant fear was wearing us down. My parents tried to stay strong for Lisa and me, but I could see the exhaustion in their eyes. Every shadow, every unexpected sound made us jump. Jeff was always in the back of our minds. One night, after weeks of living like fugitives, we checked into a small, run-down motel on the outskirts of a tiny town. The place was barely more than a couple of rooms and a flickering neon sign, but it was all we could afford. We were desperate for a break, any semblance of normalcy, even if it was just for one night. As we settled into the cramped room, my dad tried to reassure us. Just one night, he said. We'll figure out our next move tomorrow. I nodded, but I knew it wouldn't be that simple. Jeff was out there, and he wouldn't rest until he found us. That night, I had trouble sleeping, as usual. I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, listening to the distant sound of traffic and the occasional creak of the motel settling. My family was already asleep, their breathing soft and steady. I was just starting to drift off when I heard it. A faint tapping at the window. My heart leapt into my throat. I turned my head slowly, praying that I was imagining things. But there he was, standing outside the window, his pale face illuminated by the flickering neon light. Jeff the killer. His grin was wider than ever, eyes locked on the mine. I stifled a scream and shook my dad awake. Dad, he's here, I whispered, my voice shaking. My dad was up in an instant, grabbing the gun he always kept nearby. My mom and Lisa woke up too, and panic set in as I realized what was happening. Jeff didn't try to break in this time. He just stood there, watching us, his grin never faltering. It was like he was enjoying the fear he was causing. My dad aimed the gun at the window, but before he could fire, Jeff turned and disappeared into the night. We couldn't stay in the room. We packed up our things as quickly as possible and left, not even bothering to check out. We got in the car and drove. My dad gripping the steering wheel so tightly, his knuckles were white. We didn't know where we were going, only that we had to keep moving. We ended up in another town, another motel. This one was slightly nicer, but it didn't matter. The fear followed us everywhere. We barricaded the door and windows, trying to create a sense of security. But deep down, we knew it was only a matter of time. That night, I couldn't sleep at all. I sat by the window, clutching a knife, waiting for Jeff to appear. Hours passed. And nothing happened. I started to think maybe we'd lost him, that maybe he wouldn't find us this time. But then around 3 a.m., I heard it, the faint sound of footsteps outside the door. I held my breath. Listening as the footsteps grew closer, my heart was pounding so loudly I was sure he could hear it. The footsteps stopped right outside the door, and there was a long, agonizing silence. Then a knock soft, almost polite. 
just like before. My dad got up, gun in hand, and motioned for us to stay back. He approached the door slowly, his hand shaking. Who's there? He called out his voice, barely more than a whisper. There was no answer, just another knock, a little louder this time. My dad took a deep breath and flung the door open, gun raised, but there was no one there. Just an empty hallway and the sound of the wind outside. We were all on edge, waiting for something to happen. My dad slowly backed away from the door, never taking his eyes off it. Just as he closed it, we heard Jeff's voice, low and mocking. Go to sleep. I don't know how he did it, but suddenly he was inside, standing in the corner of the room, his grin wider than ever. My dad fired the gun, but Jeff moved too fast. He lunged forward, knocking the gun out of my dad's hand and slashing at him with a knife. Chaos erupted. My mom grabbed Lisa and pulled her away while I tried to help my dad. Jeff was on him, his knife flashing in the dim light. I grabbed a lamp and smashed it over Jeff's head, but it barely slowed him down. He turned to me, eyes gleaming with madness. Go to sleep, he whispered, raising the knife. Just then, my mom tackled him from behind, giving my dad a chance to grab the gun. He aimed it at Jeff and fired, hitting him in the chest. Jeff staggered back, a look of surprise on his face, but he didn't go down. He lunged at my dad again, but this time, my dad was ready. He fired again and again until Jeff finally collapsed. We stood there, panting and bleeding, staring at Jeff's lifeless body. It was over. He was dead. My mom called the police, and they arrived quickly this time, taking statements and securing the area. They confirmed Jeff was dead, his body taken away to the morgue. In the weeks that followed, we tried to piece our lives back together. The fear slowly started to fade, replaced by a cautious sense of relief. But the scars remained, both physical and emotional. We moved to a new city, far away from the memories of Jeff the Killer. It's been months now, and we're starting to feel normal again. But sometimes, late at night, I can still hear either his voice whispering. And I'm in the dark. Go to sleep. I don't think I'll ever forget him, but I'm learning to live with the fear. We survived. That's what matters. But Jeff the Killer will always be a part of me. A shadow lurking at the edge of my mind. And sometimes, when I close my eyes, I see that twisted grin and those empty black eyes. I went on a family trip in the Canadian woods. We found Jeff the Killer, and I'll never be the same again.